What a wonderful message and song. Sweet little Jesus. Boy, we didn't know who you were. Wasn't that a beautiful number? I just love that song. Just want to say that on behalf of my wife and, and I, we want to just say thank you to all of you who've been so gracious and kind and generous as we welcomed our uh, little baby Jasmine into the world on December the 5th. And we are just so thankful to have her. And she is here today. So some of you who want to see her, you may be able to see her. We're just so glad to be here with you here at the Vallejo Drive Church. Also want to mention that my brother-in-law, my wife's brother, is here today visiting with us uh, to help us out with the baby and all of that. He's all the way from Guyana, so I don't know, is he somewhere here in the congregation? Uh, there he is, way in the back. Uh, uh, Christopher, glad to have you here with us today. We are indeed very thankful and happy to be able to, to be here. This is our, what, now my, my fourth month here, and I'm just so blessed. This is a wonderful church for us to have uh, children in, and we're just so thankful for all of you. We had our son dedicated here, um, and now we have a, a baby girl coming into the world, and I'm excited to be your family pastor. And as family pastor, we have to produce children, but I do declare, I do declare, I think we're done. Amen? Amen. My father said, if you get a boy and a girl, you've got a millionaire's family. And uh, I may not have the, the money to prove it, but I feel like a million dollars. Amen, somebody. Amen. Today, I want to just invite you to share with me the message of this scripture and of this song that was just sung so powerfully and beautifully. Uh, I've captured that message and entitled it, Not Your Baby. Not Your Baby. I invite you to just turn to your neighbor and tell them, neighbor, oh neighbor, it's not your baby. Come on, come on, tell them, tell them. Oh, they, they sound like they don't believe you. Just go on and turn to your other neighbor and tell them, neighbor, oh neighbor, is not your baby. Uh-huh. That's right, it's not your baby. I can't even imagine Joseph's pain when Mary said those words. Honey, I'm pregnant, but it's not your baby. About nine months ago, my wife came to me and said, honey, I'm pregnant, but it is your baby. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, she said it. It is your baby. <laughs> Just last week on December 5th, when my baby Jasmine came into the world, I gave her my name and I, I claimed her as my own because she was my baby. Somebody said, what a, what a beautiful baby girl you have there. And, and I said, I automatically took credit. I said, of course, she's my baby. And I lay claim to her and acknowledge her as my child. I held her in my arms and I said, daddy's baby girl. In fact, all of us should hold our children in our arms like I hold my Jesse and my Jasmine and claim them. My son, Jesse, my daughter, Jasmine, you ought to give them your name and teach them your morals and share your values and love them and protect them and provide for them and take full responsibility for them and claim them as your own flesh and blood. That's the right, honorable, respectable thing to do. But here the writer of Matthew records this puzzling message from the angel, Mary, We'll have a child. You go on and marry Mary, Joseph. Protect her and that child. And care for her and that child. And raise that child and love that child. But always remember, it's not your baby. It's the child of the Holy Ghost. I don't know exactly how Mary broke the news to Joseph, but it, it sounds like drama to me. 
Doesn't that just sound like drama to you? Ma Mary's most likely story was, honey, I'm pregnant, but the baby is not yours. Well, how'd you get pregnant, Mary? The angel of the Lord appeared unto me, and angel Gabriel told me that the Spirit of God will come upon me, and I will have a child. And, and, and that child will be the son of God. Clearly, whatever she told Joseph just wasn't working. He didn't want to be a part of this baby daddy drama situation. Verse 19 says he thought to break up privately. Joseph was ready to reject Mary and her child, her baby Jesus. He didn't want to have to raise another man's baby. This must have been a bittersweet moment uh -huh, for Mary. I don't think she really knew how to handle it. I mean, how do you tell somebody, I'm pregnant, but I'm still a virgin? That's some kind of baby daddy drama there that I can, like I've never heard of before. And clearly, Joseph just wasn't buying it. He planned to break the engagement and put her away privately. But in that very moment, an angel appears telling Mary's exact same story. Verse 20, Joseph, don't be afraid to marry Mary. Yes, she's pregnant, but it's not your baby. It's the child of the Holy Ghost. Oh, I've read this story uh, hundreds of times, but I read it again this past week, and I asked the question, why should Jesus choose to be born into baby daddy drama? Why subject the pure and holy baby Jesus to such shame and embarrassment? Why must the legacy of Christ's childhood be tainted with this humiliation and ignominy? A mother who's pregnant gets pregnant by the Holy Ghost tells this tale, Joseph, it's not your baby, and an angel telling her exact same story, Joseph, it's not your baby. Oh, I wrestled with this passage all week long until finally it sat up and smiled in my face. Oh yes, the scripture does do that sometimes. And for the first time, I understood this baby daddy drama in a brand new way. You see, Jesus comes to a world filled with pride and ego. Everybody used pride and ego to cover up their shame and disgrace. So in this world where everybody wants to take credit, all humanity wants to stake their claims to goodness. Every heart wishes to embrace the, uh, the accolades and accept the congratulations of human accomplishments a world with people far removed from God's spirit men and women driven to look good be right and win everybody devoid of surrender humility and selflessness and instead filled with pomposity arrogance and pride they cried collectively God we don't need your salvation we can produce our own we can save ourselves by ourselves. We can fix ourselves by ourselves, regardless of culture, language, race, or creed. Every human being lived infected with the disease of self-righteousness. Everybody looking out for number one and seeking to prove their worth and validate themselves by their own good works. They tried to save themselves by themselves and without God, but God has always been looking for somebody to tell this message that God and God alone can produce salvation. No human being can generate salvation. Nobody can claim salvation as their own production. But even God's most faithful followers, the Jewish people, the leaders of the community kept messing this up. Everybody God tried to get to tell this truth failed miserably. He tried Noah, but Noah couldn't do it because he got saturated with pleasure and got drunk, drunk on the eve of reconstruction, drunk when he should have been sober. He tried Abraham, but he couldn't do it because he tried to produce God's promised son himself without God when he lay down and slept with Hagar. He tried Jacob, but he couldn't do it because he played too many tricks and lied to steal the birthright. A trickster caught up in his own way. He tried Moses but he couldn't do it because he hit 
the rock when he should have spoken to the rock. He put himself and ignorance and arrogance on the throne instead of surrendering to the Spirit of God. He tried David, but David couldn't do it because he slept with Bathsheba and then killed Uriah to cover it up. He tried Solomon, but he couldn't do it because he had way too many wives and too many concubines. He tried Samson, but he couldn't do it because he lost his hair when he got his head caught up in Delilah's lap. He tried Jeremiah, but Jeremiah couldn't do it because he, he just cried too much. We know him as the weeping prophet. He tried Daniel, but he couldn't do it because he was too apocalyptic and too hard to understand. He tried the entire Jewish nation, but they couldn't do it because they got drunk on legalistic self-righteousness. Finally, God says, if I can't find anybody who will go tell this message, the truth about salvation, I'll just go myself. And so God locked himself up in Mary's belly and sent an angel with this simple edgy uh, but politically incorrect message this theological plain talk in a dream joseph 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 wakey wakey don't be afraid to take mary protect her and provide for her and her child but don't take the credit don't embrace the congratulations. Don't accept the accolades because this baby, this child is not your baby. It's the child of the Holy Ghost. And that's all I came to say to you this day. This Christmas story teaches us that salvation comes from God and God alone and it's not your baby. The gospel story is not your baby. Redemption is not our own creation. It's not something we produce. Just maybe I can press my claim a little bit further because the shame of Mary's story speaks volumes here. The writer doesn't want us to miss the significance. See, Matthew's gospel opens with Jesus' genealogy. He intentionally chase, traces the ancestry of Jesus back to Abraham. He includes illustrious men of the Jewish community, of the Jew, men that the Jewish people admired and revered and loved and respected, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. If you just read Matthew chapter 1, ah, but then this writer does something so unusual in a world that typically excluded women from genealogy, genealogies. This writer includes four women, but these four women all had spotty, shameful reputations. Look at the text. He includes Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. And I suspect that nobody felt proud to be the descendants of these four women. They had bad reputations and stories of brokenness outright sin, public shame. Tamar pretended to be a prostitute. Rahab was a prostitute. Ruth was sexually forward with Boaz. Bathsheba committed adultery with King David. All these women bore the scarlet letter of shame and disgrace, but then he adds a fifth woman. Her name is Mary. Mary gets pregnant out of wedlock and must forever tell this spurious story of an immaculate conception all her life. No doubt she would face daily ridicule, scorn and shame. Here the writer shouts the gospel message regardless of your brokenness and shame. God comes to you. God will ungod himself, choose an ignoble heritage and take on human shame and brokenness and sin and embarrassment. The prophet Isaiah said it, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows and today he comes to all humanity 
hiding from sin's shame. Everybody like Adam, uh, hiding in the bushes, hiding, covering themselves up with fig leaves of shame, hiding from an angry world and a searching God. Everybody broken and battered and beaten and bruised or trying to cover it up. You know, human beings by nature are inauthentic creatures and we fix our inauthenticity. We satisfy the, the itch of our inauthenticity by seeking to look good, to be right, and to win in order to hide, protect, defend, avoid anybody knowing that deep down on the inside we are broken, battered, beaten, and bruised, and I'm not enough, and there's something wrong with me, and I'm all alone here in the world, but I stopped by to tell somebody this morning that God took all of that, the woof and hoof of human brokenness, and bundled it up and said, hey, I will still come to this earth in the form of a baby. I will take on the shame. I will embrace the embarrassment. I will accept the ridicule. I will acknowledge the scorn. I won't run from it. He says, I'm not going to hide from it. He said, I will accept it and lead broken humanity out of darkness, out of shame, out of ridicule, out of anger, out of all the brokenness and embarrassment of missing the mark when trying to do good and lead us to redemption and salvation. This is the gospel story. You can't save yourself by yourself. You can't manufacture your own righteousness. You can't make your own goodness to cover up your shame. Salvation is not your baby. You can't lay claim to it by the works of the law. You can't take credit for it and give it your name. You can't accept the accolades and embrace the congratulations because it's not your baby. It's the child of the Holy Ghost. The angel's simple message to Joseph, you must name him Jesus. Jesus means Yahweh is salvation and God saves for he shall save his people from their sins. You see, the difference between all other babies and this baby Jesus, all other babies need salvation. My babies need it and your babies need it. Oh, but Jesus, oh my Jesus, he is salvation. Yeshua means Yahweh is salvation. God saves. He saves from the guttermost to the uttermost. He saves from fear, guilt, and shame. He saves from pomposity, from arrogance, and from pride. Jesus, God's gift to a fallen world. I speak this message for somebody here today. Won't you accept Jesus as your salvation? Won't you accept him as God's greatest gift? Not just here at Christmas time, but every time, every day, for we don't have to wait for Christmas. We don't have to wait for Christmas to celebrate Jesus. Amen. Whenever God gives you Jesus, it's Christmas morning. And I go throughout the entire year just thankful that just for today I could give up looking good. I could give up being right. I could give up my drive to win at everything I do and, 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 and pretend to be better than everybody else. Why? Because I'm settled. I'm rooted, I'm anchored in the awesome reality that God has come to me and he's taken me, he's accepted my brokenness. I no longer have to perpetrate. I don't have to pretend any longer. I don't have to look good for anybody else. I don't have to live a lie. I don't have to claim it. I don't have to name it. I don't have to try to produce my own good works, try to manufacture my own righteousness. I don't need to impress anybody. I can be authentically me. I can be who I really am in Christ Jesus. I can smile at the world. I can love everybody. I can hold everybody in my arms and say, hey, I love you. I love you because God has changed my heart. He's brought me out from this dark place where I was hiding in shame, too afraid to stand up and be counted in the world, too afraid to let my voice be heard, too afraid to speak my message, to sing my song, to tell my story, to write my poetry, too afraid to leave a, leave a legacy because I was fixated on what they thought of me. I can live a life of power make a vital contribution wherever I go because of Jesus Christ. I invite somebody here today. 
if you want to just accept Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I, I invite you into my life to come and do for me, for my brokenness and my shame, what you've promised to do. To take my shame, to take my anger, to take my hurt, to take my emptiness, to take my sickness, to take my weakness and transform it. I invite you right now, I just want to pray for you. Would you stand with me wherever you are right here in the church? Would you just stand with me? I want to pray for you. Gracious God, we just thank you for your love. Oh God, I thank you for the power of the gospel that shines with a luminescent glory in the face of all our humanity where we all have tried to take credit We've all tried to produce our own good works. We've all tried to manufacture our own righteousness. We've all tried to lay claim to goodness and declare that we don't need God's salvation because we can make our own. But we've discovered, oh God, that that pathway only leads to brokenness, weakness, sickness, emptiness, and shame. And all of us, like Adam, have been hiding in the bushes scared of an angry world and a searching God. But today, this message of Jesus coming in the midst of our shame, embracing our shame, choosing a legacy, a heritage of human shame to be born into, this message rings in our hearts that the God of the universe would choose to live in our hearts to be a part of our lives, not for us to transform him, but for God to transform us. Lord, today I just pray for somebody here today, right now, in this great community of faith, oh God, we stand in your presence acknowledging that salvation is not our baby. We don't produce it. We don't manufacture it. All we could do is surrender to this baby Jesus who's born afresh and new, not in Bethlehem, but in our hearts. He's able to transform us. He's able to renew us, revitalize us, rejuvenate us, and restore us. And oh God, today I thank you for Jesus, may we surrender to his love and peace. In his holy name I pray, amen.